Well, this is the time in our meeting where um, we get the chance to listen to the voice of God. Uh, we're going to hear God speak to us in his written word. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, if you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We are working our way through the book of Acts, and so uh, we have made it to Acts chapter 10. We'll be here, I guess, for the rest of the year anyway, <clears throat> not Acts chapter 10, but the book of Acts. <laughs> Um, and uh, so we've arrived at this very integral change in uh, God's plan of redemption. We'll talk more about that. But once you find it, if you could stand with me, we're going to read together. Or actually, I'll read and you follow along. But I'm going to read the first 29 verses, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, that is around noon, to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said to him, Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up into heaven. Let's pause there. I'll continue reading later. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, as we now turn to your word, I want to pray for the Holy Spirit of God to come and visit with us one more time. You have been with us today, O oh Lord. You have enabled us to have eyes to see our Savior in song and in prayer and in joining the members that you died for to this local church. Uh, and so now, Lord, we want to hear what you have to say to us concerning these, this subject that you've laid before us today. Lord, we confess that we are slow to hear, we are slow to focus, we struggle with distractions, Lord, and so I want to just ask in this next 45 minutes or so that you'd give us ears to hear what you're saying. Let us fixate our eyes and hearts on you and your word, and Lord, I pray most of all that you would transform us by your word. Holy Spirit, do that, we pray. Do the work that we could never do. And that's changed the human heart. Do this for your glory, we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being seated. The title of my message this morning, if you're a note taker, is Compassion, Compassion Before Conversion. Compassion Before Conversion. We obviously are an increasingly cashless society, and so this doesn't happen like it used to, but there was a time when you could be walking along the streets and you would find coins on the ground as you're walking, quarters, uh, nickels, dimes, pennies, whatever. And I have a memory of my grandfather telling me as I was walking with him, he, he said to me, always make sure you pick up the coins that you find on the street because when you pick up coins, even if they're pennies, if you have enough of them, they turn into dollars. And so I remembered that from when I was a little kid. Well, recently I was walking with my youngest, and uh, we were walking along the street, and I, I said, oh, there's a penny. And he said, oh, it's just a penny. 
what do we do with the penny? Who cares? And I said, oh, you want to pick up a penny? And so I shared with him the lesson that my grandfather gave to me. And he looked at me and he just kind of went, he's like, do you know how many pennies I would have to save in order to get just a dollar? And I I said, well, yeah, a hundred. But he's like, you know how many times I see a penny on the ground? And I said, I don't know how often. And he says, hardly ever. So he passed it over and he left the penny on the ground and I picked it up. But I guess he's right. You know, pennies are pretty well close to worthless. I mean, no one's robbing the give a penny, take a penny tray uh, at the Shell station. It, it is the most humble of all coins. Uh, perhaps this is why it's fitting that the penny bears the likeness of Abraham Lincoln. Do you know that in 1909, President Theodore Roosevelt chose Abraham Lincoln to be the first per actual person to be featured on, the, um, on an American coin. Roosevelt commissioned the famous sculptor and Lithuanian emigrant, Victor David Brenner, to uh, create the design. And in fact, if you look at a penny right now, you can actually see his initials, VDB, just under the shoulder of Lincoln facing the right. Well, Roosevelt's choosing was evidently much to Brenner's delight because Lincoln was a personal hero of Brenner's due to Lincoln's compassion for the poor. It was once said that Lincoln said to one of his aides, God must have loved the poor or he would not have made so many. And so Brenner, knowing the humble penny was the most abundant of all the coins and knowing that there would be more in the pockets of the common man than any other coin, he jumped at the commission. And so when we see a penny on the ground, Victor Brenner would want us to remember that there are many more poor and common people in the world than there are rich, that the common man should not be overlooked or looked down on or passed over. After all, we who are Christians know that the common man is the very person who Jesus came and was anointed to proclaim the good news to. Jesus said in Luke 4, in this day, this saying in Luke 60, or Acts 61, excuse me, Isaiah 61 or 66 is fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor and to save them. Well, in our text today, this very lesson is a lesson that Peter had to learn, especially because if you were a Jew in the first century, you'd be conditioned to avoid and to overlook people of certain ethnicities, people who were different than you. Peter is getting ready to learn lots of new lessons, but this is one that he had to have his heart changed completely in. And friends, this is a lesson that we must all learn. It is sinful human nature that causes us to pass over certain people that causes us to show partiality, that causes us to have compassion on people who are most like us, people with whom we share common experiences, people that we have the same likes and dislikes with, people with whom we agree. But as Peter learned, and as we have to learn, God loves outsiders, God gains the glory by saving outsiders more than he does insiders. And so often he must change our heart, friends, to match his if we are going to bear fruit for him in this world, which is why he saved us in the first place. Yes, sometimes he uses us despite our pride, but he would rather use the humble, those who understand the glaring reality that apart from his grace in Christ, We are all outsiders. We are all the common man. Friends, here's what I think this text is going to say to us today. Sometimes God must change our hearts toward outsiders before he uses us to change theirs. Sometimes God must change our hearts towards outsiders before he uses us to change theirs. Now, Chapter 10 is about the conversion of this man Cornelius, but first, we're going to focus on Peter. Peter must undergo a conversion of sorts, and so today, we're going to focus on how God gives 
Peter, his heart toward outsiders. And friends, if, if you struggle or we struggle as Peter did to, to love people who are different than us, then our, our text is gonna show us that several things need to happen in our own hearts. And this is what happened to Peter. First, God had to show Peter how much he loves those who are different than us. And secondly, he must confront our wrong attitudes and prejudices towards those same people. And so let me give you my first point. God's heart revealed. God's heart revealed. In chapter 10, we're introduced to this man by the name of Cornelius, old Corny, as I heard one preacher say, uh, who evidently was a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort or regiment. Are there any Italians in the house today? Two? Okay. This is the South, I know. If this was Rhode, Rhode Island where I'm from, everybody would be like, I mean, are there any non-Italians here? Um, a cohort was made up of, of six centuries, a hundred men, uh, each commanded by a centurion. And so Cornelius would have been the equivalent of a modern day army captain. Uh, and his post was in Caesarea. In that day, Caesarea was the seat of the Roman prefect or governor of the province of Judea. Uh, Caesarea was a coastal city named uh, in the honor of Augustus Caesar, the first emperor and founder of the Roman Empire. Uh, it boasted a, a magnificent seaport, and it was the center of Roman political and cultural and military life in Judea. We are told that Cornelius was a devout man who feared God, that he was generous to the, the poor, and that he prayed continually to God. And so Cornelius was what the Bible identifies as a God-fearer. In other words, Cornelius was drawn to the God of the Jews. He was likely a sort of convert of the Jewish religion. Maybe he even attended a synagogue. Cornelius was much like the Old Testament foreigner who lived in Israel and who adopted the Jewish way of life. Later in verse 22, Luke, the author, tells us that he was an upright man. He was thought of very well by the Jewish people. So Cornelius is a man who is about as close to God as one could get. He's about as close to God as a God-fearing, as, as a Jew, uh, a, a, as a Jewish person would have been. He was familiar with the Jewish way of life, the Jewish religion, even though, now listen, he would have been very much separated from the people of God. Cornelius could get near the temple if he went to Jerusalem. He could get into the court of the Gentiles, but he could not get into the temple. He was prohibited from much ritual religion. Uh, he was, as Ephesians 2 tells us, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, a stranger to the covenants of promise. So though he is devout and God-fearing, Cornelius is a man who is still without hope and still without God. He may be waiting for the promised Messiah, but he's excluded. He may be a good man, but he's on the outside. Now, as I said earlier, friends, this is a significant point in the narrative of Acts. A new chapter in the plan of redemption is set to begin. For the first time, beside that little episode with the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, God is opening the doors to the Gentiles in a wholesale way. You know, of course, that a Gentile is a non-Jew. God, for the first time, is opening the door of the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles. And chapter 10 uncovers a layer of God's heart that until this point had largely been concealed. Now, certainly there were Gentiles under the old covenant that God went after, Remember Ruth, Ruth the, the Moabitess or Rahab the harlot from Jericho or even whole cities we saw in the story of Jonah, the Ninevites. But here, things change. The winds change. The page turns. God is now going after the nations. And he begins with this man outside of the covenant. Through this angel, God appears to Cornelius and he essentially says, Cornelius, I am. I see you. I see your attempts to find me. Now, of course, as Jesus said in John 6, 44, 
no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. But God has been drawing Cornelius by means of the Jewish religious system and has now brought him to the threshold of the doors of the kingdom of God. But his faith is incomplete. And it will be incomplete until it is centered fully on Christ alone. And so God comes to him and through the angelic messenger says, I want you to send for one called Simon, that's his Jewish name, Simon, who is called Peter. And we'll see next week that when Peter comes, he will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Cornelius, and he and his household will be saved. You see, friends, we, we tend to take for granted, don't we, our salvation. We are very much so a, a Christianized culture. And so there's almost a sense of entitlement in us who have been saved. Uh, it's very normal for us. We, we know how this works, right? The gospel is preached. A person uh, is then, an interchange happens in their heart by the Holy Spirit. The soul is regenerated. Faith is given. Confession is made. And, and for any of us in this room who have trusted in Jesus, there have been a host of means that God has used in our very Christianized culture to draw us to him. But you have to understand in Acts chapter 10, no born-again Jew ever conceived that the saving grace of Jesus Christ could be made available wholesale to the Gentiles. The Gentile is a person outside the covenant, and Jesus came first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Abraham's children according to the flesh, not to pagan outsiders. And yet here for the first time, we see how wide open God's heart is toward the outsider. The ones, friends, that you and I might respect if we were a first century Jew, but who at the end of the day, we would have said, that man is beyond God's reach. That's a penny. That's a penny. Loved ones, let us not ever forget that we in this room are all pennies. It's so easy, isn't it, to turn our noses up and to look down on people that are different than us because of the things they do or because they belong to a particular cultural subset, or they have a, a divergent lifestyle, or they have a different color skin, or they use a different accent than we use, or they, they adhere to a different political party. Maybe the person we look down on just lives their lives just, just differently than we do. They don't do normal like we do normal. And so we think of them and speak of them in judgmental ways because we're actually suspicious of them. And so we categorize them as the others. But my friend, it's very difficult, isn't it, to pray for, let alone to love, people that we're suspicious of. The book of Acts would say to us, do you know the God who saved you? Do you know his heart toward those pennies, toward you? God loves to save people who are nothing like him. And my Bible tells me in Romans chapter five that God didn't save me or you because we were decent people. No, God showed his love for us in this, that while we were weak, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. God does not save decent people. Christ came for people who are, who are not doing very well. Christ didn't come for people who don't just need a little improvement, but who are at the bottom Christ didn't come for people who just need a slight adjustment and who need a little bit of religion and who have a little <coughs> cough and need a little touch. No, Christ came for the ungodly sinner, the enemy of God. Christ came not to call the righteous, but the unrighteous to repent repentance. And friends, the truth is, is that some of us in this room might have a little bit more 
blemishes than the other person next to us? Are there be people in our lives that have more blemishes than we have? But friends, if you love Jesus today, or if I love Jesus today, it is because God in Christ did not pass you over. It's because God didn't leave you there on the ground where you and I deserved to be. If you, if you love Jesus, it's because God through the Father loved you first, chose you first, long before you ever took a breath. St. Augustine said, God chooses us not because we believe, but that we may believe. I love how J.I. Packer words this. He says, to know that from eternity, my maker, I just let this soak into your heart. My maker, foreseeing my sin, foreloved me and resolved to save me, though it would be at the cost of Calvary. To know that the divine son was appointed from eternity to be my savior and that in love he became man for me and died for me and now lives to intercede for me and will one day come in person to take me home. This is knowledge that brings overwhelming gratitude and joy. Friends, let us never cease to be amazed at the depths of God's love toward the other, toward those who are not like him. For that is every single one of us. That is, until the ninth hour on that day when he sent his angel to Cornelius and the door was opened to me and you, Gentiles. But first, God has to confront Peter's heart and attitude and prejudice. So point number two, Peter's heart challenged. Do you remember Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16, he said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So thus far, now listen, thus far we have seen Peter has been integral in unlocking every major advancement of the gospel until now. He was there preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, wasn't he? It was Peter who showed up when Philip was preaching to the Samaritans and he laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit fell. We saw Peter then go to wider Judea and he's at Lydda and he's at Joppa and finally he's going to go to Caesarea, the largest Gentile city in that area. Acts chapter 1, friends, verse 8 is taking place and you will be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem into Judea and to Samaria and the ends of the earth. Cornelius is the ends of the earth as far as Peter is concerned. And so this humble centurion obeys the divine command to send for Simon Peter, who was some 32 miles away in Joppa. Meanwhile, on noon the next day, it was the sixth hour, Peter went up to the housetop to pray. The Jews would pray at different time, hours during the day. And as so often happens when we are trying to do our spiritual disciplines, Peter got hungry. So he called down and he asked the host of the house to prepare some lunch. And while he's waiting for his food, the Lord gives Peter a vision. Now I want you to take note of what the Lord is doing here. In the vision, Peter sees the heavens open and something like a large sheet or a sail descends. And on that sheet are all sorts of animals, animals which have historically been considered by Jews to be unclean. In our modern day, these are not kosher animals. Suddenly a voice comes to Peter. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. Perhaps some of you might recall the dietary, different dietary regulations that the Lord imposed on the ancient Israelites. You can read about those in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy, other places. 
Only certain kinds of meat were allowed to be eaten by God's people. And there was very strict preparation guidelines when they would prepare them. Why? Because the Lord wanted his people to remain separate and distinct from the nations of the earth. Now, both testaments of the Bible have a lot to say to us about eating. Eating is about as basic as an act that you can get as a human being. And yet, eating has the power to cause a lot of problems, both for the one eating, health issues, but also between people. I want you to think, there's a lot of crunchy people in here. I say that lovingly. I mean, I can be crunchy too, just, well, I'll stop right there, but. Think about how offended we can sometimes get when we hear our friend saying that he or she eats certain kinds of food. Or the opposite. We get offended when we hear they won't eat certain kinds of food. Why? Because in our sinful nature, food becomes a measure of maybe a deeper ethical or a moral moral issue like self-control, like healthy eating. And so the temptation with food is to cast sinful judgment on others, and that's why the New Testament talks a whole lot about this subject. And so we will all forgive Peter, won't we? When Peter rises up and says to the heavenly voice, who is God, not once, not twice, but three times, no, Lord, by no means, for I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. To Peter, food, what's going on? Food set him apart from other races of people. His diet was a measure of his holiness, and it had long been for his own people. But what's happening here? It was food that made him look down on other races of people. So in verse 15, the voice of the Lord rebukes Peter, and he says, what God has made clean do not call unclean or common. What God has made edible, do not call inedible. Or to say it differently, what God has made accessible, do not call off limits, Peter. Friends, this is a massive statement. This statement would have flown in the face of every law-abiding Jew in Peter's day. And so it's no wonder in verse 17, verse 19, Peter is absolutely perplexed by this vision. Peter is pondering, what in the world did this mean? We can almost hear his inner thoughts. No way, there's just no way that God is removing the restrictions that he set forth in his law. There's just no way. It's just not possible. What does this mean? What's God saying to me? But we see what God's doing, don't we? There is a deeply rooted prejudice in Peter's heart. So before Gentiles are going to be accepted as part of the Christian community, God must change the hearts of his chosen people before he will use them to change the hearts of Gentiles. And so as Peter is thinking and he's meditating and he's conflicted and vexed in his spirit by what the Lord has told him, there's all of a sudden a knock on the door. Just as he's figuring out what all this means. And verse 17 says, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean. Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down, to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he arose and went with them to Caesarea. Understand what's happening. Peter is undergoing a conversion of sorts in his own heart. Now, we know Simon Peter's heart has already been warmed to the Gentiles 
He is, after all, lodging in the house of Simon a tanner. A tanner is not someone who owns a tanning booth. It is a, it is a person who would get animal hides and make leather out of animal hides. But to the Jew, you were unclean if you handled dead carcasses. And so the fact that Peter is hanging out with a tanner already says that the Lord is softening Peter's heart. That's a big step for him. But now he has this vision. Peter's never eaten fried catfish. Peter's never had bacon with his eggs. Now all of a sudden, it seems like God is saying this is fine. Now these Gentiles have showed up at my door and they want me to visit a Gentile home. What is God trying to tell me? Lord, this isn't about just food, is it? There's something more at play here. You're confronting my attitude. Friends, if you notice that so often, God does his greatest work in our hearts apart from outside or direct outside interference. And often, he will use something seemingly small, innocent, to unravel those tightly held convictions that has actually constricted our hearts, our love toward other people. Do you know that the, the honeybee is not native to North America. It was actually introduced uh, by settlers back in 1622 on the East Coast, and for the next 230 years or so, it slowly made its way, their way across the continent. But bees have changed our entire environment, our entire ecosystem in North America. A single bee can pollinate 5,000 flowers in a day. In the U.S., they're responsible for more than 130 of the types of the foods that, that we eat. Bees produce a third of the world's food supply. They produce half of the world's fibers and oils and other raw materials. The honeybee may be tiny, and I won't name any names here, but my wife is terrified of bees. Scary. I didn't say her name. But without honeybees, we would suffer immensely as a society. My friend, what if the Lord has put something tiny, something small in your life to change your environment, to make you fruitful? For Peter, it, it, was, it was food. For me, as a native northerner, it was country music. I, I, I came down here, this is a small thing, wasn't too big of a deal, but I never lived in the South. And so I, I promise you, this is not meant to be insulting. And I know I'm in a room full of Southerners, but my kids are Southerners, so I can say this. Um, I, I truly believe that Southerners were biscuit eating, Budweiser drinking, country music listening, rednecks. And that's how it was for me up North. And you probably thought, think similar things about Northerners and you can't stand them Yankees. And I understand all that and that's fine. But I got down here, and, and I appreciated the weather, but I hated country music. And so I started working at this, this, this uh, uh, a job, and in the lab where I was working, or near where I was working, there was a, a good old boy working in there. Um, super sweet guy, about as twangy, as, more twangy than Aaron. And uh, he always had country music going in the, in the lab. And so I heard country music all day, and I hated country music. Uh, but what, a strange thing happened to me. As I was working there, I recognized that I was going home and I was singing the songs that I was, sing that I was listening to. You know, good old summertime, you know, those things. And um, this was 2006, so you kind of know where I was there. But um, my attitude started to change is what happened. And my heart was being warmed toward these twangy people that I didn't know very well. And, and, and we're, we tend to be nervous around people who are different than us. And I, and I was nervous, I think. But I, I, started to, I started to really love this man. And today, Chad is still a friend of mine. I, I still keep in touch with him. He still lives in Charlotte, I believe. But he's a wonderful man. But God may use something tiny in your life. He might use a person maybe even an irritating person, like, like a bee, right? 
Maybe God's put a neighbor in your life that you can't avoid or, or, or a coworker in your life or even maybe a spouse, someone that you're nothing like, but that God keeps there because he's at work in your heart to change you, to change you. My friend, here's the reality. I'm just gonna get real with you here. It's human nature to gravitate toward those with whom we share similarities. Again, same culture, same skin color, same likes, same dislikes. This is, and this isn't wrong. There's safety in flocking together with birds of the same feather. Safe, similarity feels safe. But it's also true because of our sin nature that we tend to fear that which is different because what is different demands that we embrace discomfort if we're gonna hang out in someone else's world. Now, I'm gonna say this. It's obvious that Grace City Church is comprised mainly of members who belong to the majority culture. And I hope you'll understand when I say this. I don't apologize for this. Christ is the church builder. And for this church, he's thus far raised up white pastors and has filled his membership role with primarily white members. And today, if this sermon was preached down the road at Warner Temple AME Zion Church by my friend Clifford Barnett, this would be a totally different application on this sermon, all right? But the reality is, is that like most major societies, ours has a history of ethnocentrism, of racism. For some of you older folks, the, the civil rights movement is a first-hand memory in your mind. And now today with the 24-7 news feeds of, filled with words like DEI and reparations and immigration and every other word you can think of, the hot-button words, it seems like our world is more charged, more divided, more triggered, more hostile than ever. But what I see in Acts chapter 10 is that the Lord's rebuke of Peter in verse 15 is a harsh reminder that prejudice and sinful partiality is not a modern American stain. Get that. Making distinctions and being judges with evil thoughts, according to James 2, is a sin that remains deeply embedded in the human heart, regardless of the external markers that differentiate people groups. I don't care if you're black, white, brown, or anything in between. And friends, until we do what Peter did, and that's wrestle with the Lord's rebuke and our sinful tendency to call common those things he calls clean. And you might call common certain ethnicities or certain aberrant sexual identities or certain theological streams. Hello. Until we confront those things, friends, our evangelism, our discipleship, our ability to make much of Jesus will be stunted. Oh, we might be nice as Peter was. Peter was a nice guy. But nice is neutral, friends. Nice requires nothing of us. Love is a sacrifice. And Jesus did not dirty his hands by entering into our world and laying his life down on a Gentile cross so that we could be nice. He did this to change us, to make us peculiar, to make us loving. And love demands that we lay down our preferences. It demands that we flex in order to reach the other pennies that we would normally pass over. So who's the tiny bumblebee in your life? Who, who has God put in your life that you are to invite in? to dine with as Peter did. People have different life stages. People have different economic classes. You know, the early church fathers, they, they saw that sheet being lowered down, the four corners of the sheets representing the four corners of the earth and all the different types of animals being all the different types of people. I think that's a good picture. Friends, will we as a church be willing to embrace what is different? God may confront us with something as innocent as food or music or hobbies. But let's not ignore the, the rebuke of this text, the challenge of this text. 
Like Peter, let's ponder what the Spirit is saying to us here today. Only then can our hearts be changed. And so number three, and finally, Peter's heart's changed. I'll just say a few words here. Peter's heart changed. His pondering pays off. At some point between inviting Cornelius' servants in and arriving at Cornelius' house in Caesarea, God changed Peter's heart. 32 miles on foot, having conversations with people that are not like you will have a tendency to do that. Or maybe some insightful conversation happened back at the house before they left. Or maybe when Peter arrived at Cornelius' house and he, he saw all of his relatives and friends waiting. Let's, let's read that. The next day, verse 23, he arose and went away, verse 24. And on the following day, he went to Caesarea. He entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourself know how, how, no, how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person. He's got it. This isn't about food. Any person, common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection and I asked why you sent for me. Maybe the Lord used this uncomfortable moment where Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet and began to worship him. And then Peter had to go over to Cornelius and wrap his arms around that Gentile centurion and help him up off the ground when his heart was changed and he was able to look at him, Jew and Gentile, together and say, I too am just a man. John Stott is helpful here when he says, whether consciously or subconscious, subconsciously, unconsciously, Peter had just now rejected both extreme and opposite attitudes which human beings have sometimes adopted towards one another. He had come to see that it was entirely inappropriate either to worship somebody as if divine, which Cornelius had tried to do to him, or to reject somebody as if unclean, which he would have previously done to Cornelius. Peter refused both to be treated by Cornelius as if he were a god and to treat Cornelius as if he were a dog. I think Cornelius did this because he knew it was common knowledge that Jews would not enter into the house of a Gentile. Peter's presence in that house was a shock for everyone there. But it showed everyone present, my friend, how wide open God's heart is toward those who are outsiders, pennies, toward the nations. That the blessing of Abraham given way back in Genesis 12 is now available for any who turn and trust in the Messiah. There's no longer any distinction, my friend. There's no longer eligible and ineligible. All are eligible. The provisions that, that, that God put in his law for cleanliness were only temporary until Jesus came when he fulfilled in his sinless body all ceremonial and sacrificial provisions of God's law in himself, including dietary regulations. All has been absorbed and fulfilled in Christ. In Christ, the law means that we are no longer relate with people or God on the basis of law. Now for everyone who is in him, by faith, the law is satisfied and Jew and Gentile now stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Now friend, next week we'll continue this story about Cornelius' conversion, but Peter had to be converted first. God had to change his heart before he will use them, him to change theirs. Now, please understand, my friend. Peter's heart has been changed. But I want to encourage those of us who have deeply rooted prejudices in our hearts 
Maybe even now God is revealing them to you. And you just have such a history with the other person or the different person that you just look and you say, I have no idea what I'm going to do here. I can't. God, you have to do something in my heart because I do show partiality. I just want to encourage you by looking at Simon Peter. Ten years after this event, Peter would be visiting the brothers and sisters in Antioch of Syria. And he'd be sitting down having a nice meal with them. And all of a sudden, there'll be a knock at the door and Peter's Jewish brothers are showing up. And as soon as Peter looks out the peephole, he runs and hides because he's afraid about his Jewish brothers seeing him eating with Gentiles. And Paul will have to rebuke him for it in Galatians chapter 2, a decade after this event. If you see partiality in your heart and you just think, there's no way, just know sanctification is a lifelong journey. God so often doesn't change us overnight. So often he changes us with little strides, little experiences, little conversations, little moments of learning and failing and growing. That's how God changes us. So take heart as you read this story of this brother and know that Jesus' work on the cross is enough to redeem even your sinful partiality and my sinful partiality. And he wants to bring all of us to a place of faith and repentance again and again. As I close, I just want to give you just a few evaluation questions to evaluate your heart. They all have yes or no answers. Listen to these questions, consider them, and we'll pray. Am I willing to be flexible so that people who are not like me feel welcome and comfortable around me just as Jesus did when he entered into my sinful world? Answer that question for yourself. Will I stop speaking harsh, joking, or critical, unwholesome words about people toward whom God's heart is open? People of different political convictions, personal preferences, sexual temptations, sinful lifestyles, theological persuasions, or cultural traditions? Will I instead pray for, seek to bless, and reach out to those who are different than me, embracing discomfort like Christ did for me so that God might use me to lead them to the doors of his kingdom? Do I regularly meditate on the death of Christ for an ungodly enemy outsider like me? Do I see my name in his wounds which have atoned for every sinful distinction and ugly prejudice in my heart? And finally, will I repent of my sinful prejudices and receive God's grace in Christ to love my neighbor? Do this, Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's pray together.